Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 7, Chapter 21 of Gardens of the Moon, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review and is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know this to be the best fantasy story yes. ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events in this book in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those of you that have not read the books. We will try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. But knowing me and my big math, I'm sure to spoil something for someone. So in advance, I'm sorry. Just sorry. I mean, I'm deeply, sincerely sorry for not taking the time to find somebody to be sorry for. <laughs> and I know that you've come to rely on my sorries, so sorry that I have nothing to be sorry for Yeah. <laughs> We'll get some fan mail, and you will be sorry when you start getting that. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, <laughs> Talking no. about you not being sorry, not having the not... right stuff, <laughs> setting the precedent, then letting people down. Oh, you hey. just wait. <laughs> I'm getting, I'll work on this, folks. I'll pause. A quick warning today's episode contains an act of extreme violence. <laughs> listener discretion is advised. Now, our show is listener supported, and if you'd like to support us, we would very much appreciate that. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link or at our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Also, we would really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments, especially about Billy not having anything to be sorry for, sorry. at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. <laughs> Chapter 21, Part 2. Last we had heard, Kruppa had walked up to Baruch and Anamander Rake at the fate and sprayed them with crumbs, then walked off to the kitchen <laughs> to look for it. <laughs> and now we are still at the fate. Turban Orr stood with his back to the wall and surveyed the crowded room. Relaxing was difficult, for the last week had been exhausting. He still awaited confirmation from the Assassin's Guild that Call was dead. It was unusual for them to take so long to complete a contract, and sticking a knife into a drunk shouldn't have been too difficult. His spy hunt had reached a dead end, but he was convinced that such a man or woman existed. Again and again, his moves in the council were blocked by counter moves, too unfocused for him to point a finger at any one person. But the proclamation was dead in the water. What were, you, what were you laughing about? I'm laughing at the our oh, woman. So it's Monty Python. <laughs> It's like okay. old man, woman, or it's like or, or, or old woman, man. It's like, okay. but, you know, it's, but there's that, and there's also the Monty Python from Life of Brian in the discussion. Mm, right. You uh, alluded people, to that. Yes. yes last I think, episode, yeah. I believe, or yeah. episode Something before similar, that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. Something like that. Just woman, woman. It's always mm -hmm. or woman. So we got to make sure or woman. What, yeah. what do you mm -hmm. want about women, Rage? <laughs> <laughs> After he'd come to the conclusion that the proclamation was dead in the water this morning, he'd acted and sent his most trusted and capable messenger to pale and to the Empire. He knew the Malazans were on the way, and no one in Darujistan could stop them. The Moon's Lord had been defeated once at Pale. Why would it be any different this time around? No, the time had come to ensure that his own position would survive the Empire's occupation, or, better yet, an even higher rank to reward his vital support. Yeah, right. right. Well, I say that. I believe there are some instances of people getting offered positions as fist, right, when they help take over. Yeah, you're correct. I believe it's alluded to that that is how some people have got their, their appointments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Orr's eyes fell on a guard stationed to one side of the spiral staircase. The man looked familiar somehow. Not his face, but the way he stood, the set of his shoulders. Orr knew by his garb that the man wasn't stationed at Majesty Hall. The guard adjusted his helmet strap, and Turban Orr gasped. He leaned back against the wall, overcome by trembling. Despot's Barbican! All those nights, night after night, for years, that guard had witnessed his midnight meetings with his allies and agents. There stood his spy. He straightened, closing one hand over the pommel of his dueling sword. He wanted his vengeance to be swift and immediate. He'd let no one stop him. His eyes fixing on the unsuspecting guard, Turban Orr stepped forward and collided with a hard shoulder. He staggered back. A large man in a tiger mask turned to him. Orr waited for an apology, but received only silence. <laughs> <laughs> he moved to step past the man. The stranger's arm intercepted him and poured wine down his chest. <laughs> Idiot, Orr snapped. I am Councilman Turban Orr, out of my way. 
<laughs> I know who you are, the man said quietly, or jabbed a finger into the man's chest. Keep that mask on so I'll know who to look for later. Relic said, I didn't even notice your mask. Fooled by the nose, I suppose. <laughs> Ow. Relic's really Ow. poured it on thick here. Yeah. The wine then insulting his nose too? I mean, come on. I think this may be where my huge love of Relic really develops. And this is from this, and, the, and then the brutal insults that continue from, because there's a few more that we're going to be oh, peppered geez. through here that it just it continues to grow. I was yes. like, I love it. It's great. Yeah, well, it's fantastic. Or his eyes narrowed, he grated, eager to die, are you? I will oblige you in a few minutes. Right now I have, Relic said, I wait for no man, and certainly not for some thin-lipped prancer pretending <laughs> to manhood. <laughs> if you've the belly for a duel, make it now, or stop wasting time with all this talk. Oh my God, this is as funny as Kruppa to me, because I, I, I kind of feel bad for someone here. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you feel bad for? Uh, I, I feel bad for Councilman Orr. <laughs> really? He yeah. wants it. He wants the fight. Oh, he, he, he does. Yes, he does. Yeah. Oh. Shaking, Turban Orr took a step back and faced the man directly. He asked, what's your name? Relic said, you're not fit to hear it, Councilman. Orr raised his hands and whirled to the crowd. Hear me, guests. Unexpected entertainment for you all. Conversation died and everyone faced the Councilman. He continued, a fool has challenged my honor, friends. And since when has Turban Orr permitted such an insult? Voices in the crowd rose with excitement. Orr pointed at Ralik Nam. This man, so bold as to wear Trake's face, will be dead shortly. Look upon him now, friends, as he looks upon you, and know that he is all but dead already. Ralik said, stop babbling. <laughs> the councilman pulled the mask from his face, showing a tight grin. He said, if I could kill you a thousand times, it would not be enough to satisfy me. I must settle with you but once. Ralik removed his mask and tossed it onto the carpeted stairs. He looked at Orr and asked, Done breaking wind, Councilman? Orr <laughs> scowled and said, Unmasked and still a stranger. So be it. Find yourself a second. Orr had a revelation, and he turned back to the crowd, searching it. Toward the back, he saw the mask he sought, that of a wolf. His selection of a second could have political benefits, assuming the man accepted. And in this crowd, he'd be a fool to deny Orr. He said loudly, For my second, I would be honored if Councilman Estrasian Darl acted as my second. The wolf started. Beside him stood two women, one no more than a girl. Darl's wife was dressed as a veiled woman of callows, while the girl dressed in the minimal garb of a bargast war maiden. <laughs> Both wife and daughter spoke to Estrasian. Then he stepped forward. He rumbled, the honor is mine, completing the ritual acceptance. Now this Bargas war maiden, what does this look like to you? Because for me, it has to be outrageous. So I picture Raquel Welch in 1 million years BC, maybe with some woad body paint added. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Okay. And, 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 yeah. And, and, yeah. She's got to be the, pushing this, the limit a little bit, right? She's yeah. young. You know, she's got to be trying to get we know, attention. We know she's and we know she's attractive. Mm -hmm. So, she, so yeah, I'm assuming that this is very much what I, yeah. Yeah. And thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> I, she was a good look. She was a pretty lady. Didn't she just pass away recently? I think so. It was a couple months it's ago. Very, very recently, yeah. I, yeah. I think it was very, yeah. very recently. Wasn't that one of the posters that Andy Dufresne had covering the hole that he was digging to get out of the prison on uh, Shawshank Redemption? I think that was one of them, wasn't it? It might have been. I can't remember. I've only seen that once. Okay. And I, because I, I, it's funny because you've read the book, haven't you? Different yes. seasons. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a Rita Hayworth picture. And I can't remember what it's from, though. I thought he had multiple different ones over the years. He probably did, but yeah. it was the Rita because it was the Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank yeah, Redemption. That. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing I remembered, and it, it could have been because it could have very well have been that poster. Yeah, I need to go watch that again. I, I, it's been a long time. It's a great movie. I don't know. I don't know why I've only watched it once. I don't like yeah, emotional movies. Yeah, that's a rough one to get through. The stuff he's got to go through. Yeah, yeah. Upon Estrasian Darl's acceptance, Turban Orr felt a surge of triumph. To have his most powerful enemy in the council at his side for this duel would send a message mixed enough to panic half the council members present. Pleased with his coup, he faced his nameless opponent again and asked, And your second? Silence fell over the room. In a low voice, 
Simtal said, I haven't much time. After all, as the hostess for this fate, the man before her said, it's your duty to satisfy your guests. He brushed the hair from her forehead and said, which is something I'm certain you can do and do well. She smiled and walked to the door. She locked its latch, then spun to face the man again. She said, perhaps half an hour. The man walked to the bed and tossed down his leather gloves. He said, I'm confident that those 30 minutes will be satisfying indeed, each more than the last. Lady Simtal joined him beside the bed. She slipped her arm around the man's neck and drew his face down to hers. She whispered, I suppose that you've no choice now but to tell the widow Lim the sad news. She kissed him, then began to run her tongue along his jaw. The man asked, hmm, what sad news is that? She said, oh, that you found yourself a more worthy lover, of course. Her tongue reached into his ear. Abruptly, she pulled back and met his eyes searchingly. Do you hear that? She asked. He drew her closer and asked, hear what? She said, that's just it. It's suddenly quiet downstairs. I'd better, the man said, they're in the garden, no doubt. The minutes are passing, lady. She hesitated, then made the mistake of letting him press his body against hers. Lady Simtal's eyes widened in near alarm. Her breathing changed. So, she gasped, what are we doing still dressed? Good question, Marilio growled, pulling them both onto the bed. Question for you on her motivations. Do you think she's more excited by the win she thinks she's gained over Lim's widow, or do you think she's excited because Marilio's actually that desirable of a man? I think it started off as the first, as the, as, as the first thing, trying uh -huh. to uh, win the game over Lim's widow, but I believe after especially he pulled up near to her i mean that was because she felt what he was packing so she's like all of a sudden she's intrigued i'm pretty sure i'm so sorry to be that vulgar but you know because uh, i always envision him as going for lower hanging fruit and not being in the upper echelons of that crowd and the thing is is we're not told oh, i don't recall a whole lot being said about morelio he apparently he has the appearance of you know he has that look of being able to move in that crowd but what is he really because the people we've seen him talking to are always low tier women yeah they're not the wives of the most powerful people in darujistan in other words or the yeah, most in, attractive isn't limbs in limb himself he was he's a pretty big somebody he was turban or's lackey was he his lackey turban or was definitely more powerful than him he was allied with him right so I just can't remember. I'm basing this on future knowledge group later, right? Yeah. Where yeah. was definitely the most powerful and the other ones were like lampreys attached yeah. to him, yeah. you know, <laughs> and that, that's nice. kind of how I envision yeah. limb was like a lamprey attached okay. to or. Okay. okay. Right on. Or but remora, he, if you will, whatever right. you want to call it. whatever right. symbiotic, but semi parasitic sure. animal. <laughs> You know, so just using the the greater beast's existence right. to further their own. Yeah, ones that are ones that are large enough to generate their own special ecosystem. <laughs> but to the original point, we've never really seen Murillo going for the higher tier of women. That's why I was asking it, whether Simtal would even be interested in him because he's not going for women at that level you know because she based on what we've heard she's very desirable and then she, yes. she's able to get with the most powerful people yes but is she, what is, is she is she able to acquire anything from these meetings other than just info for or or i mean who you know we still don't know. I've never heard a whole lot of her plans out of this stuff. I think for her, it was all just making sure she had power over other people, just gathering yeah. as much as she could. I think you're right. Just greedy, just greed. Yeah. And using the assets that she had to manipulate the men is yeah. basically how she got there. Yeah. yeah, you're right. In the silence following Turban Orr's question about who Relic's second would be, Baruch was preparing to step forward, knowing well what that would reveal. He felt compelled nonetheless. Ralik Nam was there to right a wrong. More, the man was a friend, closer to the alchemist than Kruppa or Murillo, and in spite of Ralik's profession, a man of integrity. Or was Simtal's last link to power. If Ralik killed the man, she'd fall. Call's return to the council was something Baruch and his fellow mages in the Tarud Cabal greatly desired. Or's death would be a relief. More was riding on this duel than Ralik imagined. The alchemist adjusted his robe and drew a deep breath. A large hand closed on his upper arm, and before Baruch could react, Rake stepped forward. 
I offer my services as second, he said loudly. He met Ralik's eyes. The assassin betrayed nothing, not once looking at Baruch. He answered Rake's offer with a nod. Or sneered, perhaps the two strangers know each other. Rake said, we've never met. However, I find myself instinctively sharing his distaste for your endless talk, councilman. <laughs> Thus, I seek to avoid a council debate on who will be this man's second. Shall we proceed? That's a sick burn right there. Mm. How much courtly experience do you think Rake has accumulated in his lifetime? Oh, way too much. Way too much, I imagine, for his taste and ours, I'm sure. But I mm -hmm. too love that sick... Wow. I love that sick burn, but man, between Ralic, Rake, and Turbinor, Turbinor is just getting hotter under the collar every second. I, and I love how they just both have not passed up a chance to insult him. He's asking for it. He's oh, there he is. Especially he man, is. he's really asking for it. Mm -hmm. Or led the way out to the terrace, Darl behind him. Baruch turned to follow. Then he felt a familiar contact of energies at his side. He swung his head and recoiled. He said, "Good gods, Mammoth! Where did you get that hideous mask?" Mamet softly said, an accurate rendition of Jaghut features, I believe, though I think the tusks are a little short. Baruch shook himself and asked, have you managed to find your nephew yet? Mamet said, no, I am deeply worried by that. Baruch said, well, let's hope that Opan's luck holds for the lad. Mamet said, of course. Whiskey Jack's eyes widened as a crowd of excited guests poured out from the main chamber and gathered on the terrace. Fiddler arrived at his side and said, it's a duel, Sergeant. The guy with the wine stain on his shirt is one of them, a councilman named Orr. Nobody knows who the other man is. He's over there with that big man in the dragon mask. I just had a flash <laughs> of imagery in my head as uh -huh. I was reading this. It's a walk-off from Zoolander. <laughs> I think I told you this story before where Billy Zane announces the walk-off between Zoolander and Hansel. Oh, you've, yeah, you have mentioned that a long time ago. When Fiddler announces <laughs> it's a duel, I just, that image oh, flashed in my head. Yeah, the walk-off. Oh, no. Oh, no. Because <laughs> that's basically a duel. Yeah, right. That would be too funny. I would love yeah. that. <laughs> Whiskey Jack had been leaning with his arms crossed against one of the marble pillars encircling the fountain. But when he saw the tall dragon-masked figure, he came near to falling into the fountain behind him. He cursed, Hood's balls! Recognize that long silver hair, Fid? Fiddler frowned. Whiskey Jack said, Moonspawn. That's the mage, the lord who stood on that portal and battled Tatrin. He reeled off an impressive list of curses, then added, And he's not human. Fiddler groaned, Tist Andy, the bastards found us. We've had it. Whiskey Jack recovered from his shock and said, Shut up. Line everybody up the way that Captain Stillis wanted us. Backs to the woods and hands on weapons. Move! Fiddler scrambled. Whiskey Jack watched Fiddler round up his men. He wondered where in Hood's name were Kalam and Perrin anyway, then caught Quick Ben's eye and gestured the mage over. Quick Ben leaned close and said, Fid explained it. I may not be much use, Sergeant. That barrow dwellers unleashing waves of nasty stuff. My head feels ready to explode. And look around. You can pick out all the mages by the sick looks on their faces. If we all accessed our warrens, we'd be fine. Whiskey Jack asked, then why don't you? Quick Ben grimaced and said, that Jag Hut would fix on us as if we were a beacon of fire. And he'd take the weaker ones, even from this distance. He'd take them. And then there'd be Hood to pay. <laughs> There'll be heck to pay, I tell you. <laughs> heck. Is that Butters? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whiskey Jack watched as the guests created a space on the terrace, lining up on either side. He ordered, check with Fidgen... Ha Check, dude, I can't talk. Check with Hedge and Fiddler. Make sure they've got something handy in case it all comes apart. This estate's got to burn then, hot and long. We'll need the diversion to set off the intersection mines. Give me the nod telling me they're up to it. Quickman agreed and moved off. Whiskey Jack grunted in surprise as a young man stepped around him, dressed as a thief, complete with the face mask. Excuse me, the man muttered as he walked into the crowd. Whiskey Jack stared after him, then glanced back at the garden. He thought, how had the lad got past them in the first place? He could have sworn they sealed off the woods. He loosened his sword surreptitiously in its sheath. Look at how the bridge burners handled Rake showing up. They maintain discipline and continue their mission without any hesitation. That's one of the reasons I love these guys so much. Is man, they just roll with it and they it's adapt, improv uh, adapt, improvise, and improve. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. 
adapt, improvise, overcome. Is that? <laughs> yes, I, I said I said improve. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's, okay. I think yeah. I, for, I forget the order of that, but there is an order to that. Adapt, uh, okay. adapt, improve, improvise, or something like that. I forget. Okay. Crocus didn't know what kind of costume Chalice Darl would be wearing, and he was resigned to a long hunt. He felt guilty that he'd left Absalar at the garden's back wall. Still, she'd seemed to take it well, though in a way that made him feel even worse. Why does she have to be so nice about things? He didn't notice the crowd's strange formation, since he was looking for a head somewhere at chest level to everyone else. As it turned out, that proved unnecessary, for Chalice Darl's costume was no disguise. Krogus found himself between two burly house guards. Across from him, 20 feet away with no one to block his view, stood Chalice and an older woman who Krogus assumed was her mother. Their attention was on a tall, severe-looking man standing at one end of the cleared space and speaking with another man who was strapping on a dueling glove. It slowly dawned on Krogus that a duel was but moments away. Squeezing between the two guards, Krogus craned his neck to find the other duelist. At first he thought it was the giant with the dragon mask and two-handed sword. Then his gaze found Ralik. His eyes snapped back to the first duelist. Familiar. He nudged the guard on his left and asked, Is that Councilman Turban Orr? The guard said, It is, sir, with an odd tightness in his tone. Crocus glanced up to see the man's face wet with sweat, trickling down from under his peaked helmet. Strange. Crocus casually asked, So where's Lady Simtal? Relieved, the guard said, Nowhere in sight, otherwise she'd stop this. Crocus nodded at that and said, well, Ralik will win. The guard's gaze was on him, the eyes hard and piercing. He asked, you know the man? Crocus began to respond when someone tapped his back and he turned to find a cherub's face smiling at him. The figure said, why, Crocus, lad, what an inventive costume you're wearing. Crocus said, Kruppa? Kruppa replied, well, guessed. The painted face swung to the guard. He said, oh, kind sir, I have a written message for you. Kruppa placed a scroll into the man's hand and said, compliments of a longtime secret admirer. Crocus grinned. These guards had all the luck when it came to noble ladies. <laughs> Circle Breaker accepted the scroll and slid the silk tie off of it. He'd sensed Orr's eyes on him more than once, and he prayed Relic would kill Orr. He felt his own fear racing through his body, and it was with trembling hands that he read the eel's message. That he read the eels message. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. I was about to say something. You corrected yourself. Thank you. That's a fan favorite, apparently. Uh, nice. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the time has come for Circle Breaker to retire from active duty. The circle is mended, loyal friend. Though you have never seen the eel, you have been his most trusted hand and you have earned your rest. Think not that the eel simply discards you now. <laughs> Such is not the eel's way. (laughs) The sigil at the bottom of this parchment will provide you passage to the city of Davran, where loyal servants of the eel have prepared your (laughs) arrival by purchasing an estate and a legitimate title on your behalf. You enter a different world soon with its own games. Trust your new servants, friend, in this and all other concerns. Proceed this very night to the Davran Traders Pier in Lakefront. You seek the river longboat named Enscalader. That sounds that's right. That sounds very Nordic sounding, but yes. <laughs> Show the sigil to any crewmen aboard. All are servants of the eel. The time has come, Circle Breaker. <laughs> the circle is mended. Fare you well. This is a really generous offer that Kruppa is providing to Circle Breaker. This would cost a fortune. Do you think Kruppa uses the proceeds of his thieving to support stuff like this? You know, I, I guess so. I think so. And all of a sudden, it's just kind of like Kruppa is not such a bad. He's not. He's always been an annoying fellow, but he's all of a sudden a little bit more altruistic than I realized. And so is. And I love. I love Circle Breaker because he's proven himself to be loyal. And mm-hmm. even though even though we don't get to know him, he has such a profound love for Dirigistan that he's willing to lay down his life for it. Yes. Dirigistan pride sounds similar to Texas pride, brother. They must make, <laughs> him, take Dirigis- they must make him take that Dirigistan history in uh, seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I moved here in the eighth grade, so I never had to take oh. Texas history. Oh, you missed it, dude. <laughs> it's great stuff, dude. Texas history is mm. amazing. It's wild. All history's wild, man. If you, mm-hmm. if you look, this is a contested over piece of land. So yeah, it's pretty wild, man. Yes. 
Baruch threw up his hands in exasperation and bellowed, Enough of this! I will referee this duel and accept all responsibility. Judgment of victory is mine. Accepted by both parties? Or nodded and thought, even better than Estrasian being his second. Baruch's proclaiming him victor in the duel would be a coup in its own right. Or said, I accept. Ralik said, as do I. His short cloak was drawn about his body. Wind thrashed the treetops in the garden, sweeping down from the east. Thunder boomed from this side of the hills. Some of the crowd seemed to flinch. Or grinned and stepped into the cleared area. Leaves scrolled past. He said, before it rains. His allies in the crowd laughed at this. Okay, I have a specific image in mind here mm -hmm. with this scene. Have you seen Conan the Destroyer? Is that still Schwarzenegger? Yes. Or is it the Jason the Momoa? The second one with Schwarzenegger. Uh, no, I've only seen the first one. Okay. At the end of the movie, there's this scene where they're about to resurrect this god named Dagoth. And there's this ritual going on. There's this music going on in the background. It's, it's kind of like a party. And right. then as the ritual's going on, these thunderstorms roll in. It's very reminiscent of the scene that I'm seeing here as the wind's picking up, the thunderstorm's coming in, you know, okay. I'm assuming they're playing music at the fate. You know, it's a very yeah. similar type scenario. Yeah, you should watch that. It's entertaining. Okay. Did you ever see the... Did you see the Conan with Jason Momoa? I don't know if I got his name right. The guy that plays Aquaman. I've never seen Aquaman, but... Yeah, I saw a little bit of it. I lost interest, actually. It's not great, but I enjoyed... The Carnage was really good. Mm. It's really bloody. It could have yeah. been better, but but I read something recently talked about the fact that people had to... I think it was a too many hands in the pie on that kind of film. Mm. Yeah, you got to have a director with a really strong vision and yeah. the clout to shut all these producers up. That's right. Sometimes shorts will pop up with interviews of Quentin Tarantino for me on my YouTube feed. And mm -hmm. he was talking about the scene in Reservoir Dogs where Mr. White cuts the ear off the cop. And Harvey Weinstein was trying to get him. He he famously would get his hands in the editing process. Harvey Weinstein. Oh, okay. And he was trying to get Quentin Tarantino to cut that scene because he said, women would not like the movie because of that scene. And Quentin Tarantino told him to F off. And people still love the movie. You know, it mm -hmm. launched his career pretty much. Yes, it did. But that's the kind of stuff that happens where yeah. people without the vision kind of get involved, the people with the money, and they kind of start twisting it. You compromise for their for – their, yes. you compromise. Right. I think compromise is one of the most evil words in the English language. Well, I mean, you kind of have to compromise. Sometimes, sometimes you must. But yes. for the most part, compromise yeah. costs a lot of times more i guess it depends on the context well let's say that yes <laughs> yeah okay or continued of course it might prove more entertaining to draw things out a wound here a wound there shall i cut him to pieces slowly he feigned dismay at the chorus of eager assent he went on too eager for blood friends must the ladies dance on slick flagstones once darkness falls we must consider our host another aside here i'm sorry to keep interrupting well, this, no problem but on Reddit the other day, on the Malazan subreddit, somebody posted that they had read the entire 10 books before they looked up what flagstone meant, and they thought it meant that it was a rock that held a flagpole, and they were super oh. confused <laughs> okay. throughout the whole series because they didn't know what flagstones <laughs> That'd be a very confusing very image. Sure. What are all these yeah. flagstones doing here? Yeah, a lot of flags, yeah. hundreds of flags in this courtyard here, <laughs> thousands even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gracious. Or had just mentioned, we must consider our host. Then he thought, where was Simtal? His imagination conjured an image in answer, and he frowned. He coldly said, no, indeed, it shall be quick, and unsheathed his sword, then fastened his gloves leather straps to the ornate grip behind the bell guard. He scanned the faces in his audience, even now seeking some betrayal of expression. He had friends who were enemies, enemies who would be friends. The game would continue beyond this moment, but it could prove a telling moment. He would recall every face later and study it at his leisure <laughs> or assumed his stance. Are you getting a picture of <laughs> photographing so, memory here yes. or something? Or Okay. Well, it's just, I love his revenge checklist. It's... <laughs> 
it's just like it's and he's plotting and i and i'm sorry just knowing what's coming it's kind of fun mm -hmm. knowing all, all this plotting all this, yeah. i'm gonna get every one of you anyone who doesn't <laughs> smile at me from yeah. second grade on is getting it <laughs> You know, it's like, this guy's a, a nasty creature. Oh, he's a nasty he? piece of work, dude. He is. Or assumed his stance. Relic stood 10 feet away with both hands hidden beneath his cloak. He looked at ease, almost bored. Or demanded, <laughs> what's this? Where's your weapon? Relic said, I'm ready. Baruch placed himself equidistant between the two duelists, slightly off to one side. His face was pale, as if he was sick. He said, comments from the seconds? Rake made no reply. Astrasian Darl cleared his throat. I hereby make it known that I oppose this duel as facile and trite. He stared at Turban Orr and said, I find the councilman's life irrelevant in the best of times. Should he die, there will be no vengeance pact from the house of Darl. He looked at Ralik and said, You, sir, are freed of that. Ralik bowed. Orr's smile tightened. The bastard would pay for that, he vowed. He lowered himself into a crouch, ready to launch an attack as soon as the duel began. This, the bastard would pay for that, reminds <laughs> me of a story with one of my uh -oh. kids. Uh-oh. You want to hear it? <laughs> yes, of course okay. I want to hear it. <laughs> I'm standing in the kitchen, in the living room. My youngest son, who was, I want to say, about five at the time, was in there with my second son, who was probably 11. Okay? Okay. I hear my youngest son say, you will pay for that. And then <laughs> seconds later, <laughs> seconds later, I hear my older son howling in pain. My youngest son had taken his hand and slashed my older son's cheek with his fingernails. Golly. But like, you know, oh my gosh, is it like, is it like Clockwork Orange style? And it wasn't like bad, bad, you know, like, but. <laughs> Just the sequence of events, the, the fact that I hear, because he whispered it in a he very menacing pay. tone, and then the howl he, coming he, shortly after that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he did pay for it. So he did you're, pay. You're, I don't know what it was wow. that he did that made the younger one think he deserved that, but man, just the the, the hearing oh, that. My word, I mean, that is amazing. That's exactly what I'm imagining here. It's exactly, exactly. What I'm imagining it's exactly you're gonna pay they're all gonna pay yeah, <laughs> yeah and coming from a five-year-old nonetheless right this is about the maturity level of turban or it is yeah, yeah. brooke said you have been heard astrasian darl he raised a handkerchief before him then released it or jumped forward and lunged in a single fluid motion so fast he'd fully extended his weapon before the handkerchief struck the paving stones he saw his opponent's left hand dart under his blade, then twist up and outward, a short, curved knife flashing in its grip. The parry was a blur, yet Orr caught it and deftly disengaged, driving his point low and toward the man's midsection. He had no time even to notice the second knife as Ralik turned his body sideways. The blade in his right hand guided Turban Orr's sword past him. The assassin stepped in then, his left hand moving in a high swing that buried its blade in the councilman's neck. Ralik followed this by driving his other knife into Orr's chest. Orr staggered to one side, his sword clanging to the stones as he clutched at the gushing wound in his neck. The motion was reflex, for he was already dead from the wound in his heart. He toppled. Mm. What a way to go. It was so quick, too. I love it. So, yeah, so, so quick and totally almost anticlimactic if it wasn't for the fact that I just wanted Orr to get it so bad for all of his little petulance mm -hmm. and his arrogance. I was ready for him to get it, but I loved how Ralic just didn't even break a sweat. And he's in bad shape, even. Yes. He's in, replenishing all the blood loss, apparently, that he'd lost, but still takes this guy out without even breaking a sweat. Right. Yeah. He only had to do one step. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just gonna move it to the side, little Perry stabbed the heart mm. in the back. There you go. <laughs> right. Ralic stepped back, weapons once again hidden beneath his cloak. He whispered, A thousand other deaths would not have satisfied me, but I'll settle for this one. Only Rake and Baruch could hear him. Baruch stepped close and made to speak, but then at a gesture from Rake, he turned to see Astrasian Darl approaching. The councilman's heavy eyes held Ralic and said, I might suspect, given your style, that we have witnessed an assassination. 
Of course, not even the Guild of Assassins is brash enough to commit public murder. Therefore, I've no choice but to keep such suspicions to myself and leave it at that. Good evening, gentlemen. He whirled and walked away. Rake looked at Ralik and said, I think that was a rather uneven match. A crowd closed in around Turban Orr's body. Voices shouted in dismay. Baruch studied the cool satisfaction on Ralik's face and said, It's done, Ralik. Go home. An unmasked, large, rounded woman in a bright green, gold-trimmed robe joined them. She smiled broadly at Baruch and said, Greetings. Interesting times, yes? A personal servant stood at her side, bearing a padded tray on which squatted a water pipe. Imagine having a personal servant carrying your hookah around for you. Right? That's living, baby. <laughs> just, that's just for the hookah. So, just for the hookah. Just for the hookah. Yep. Does she have a servants for other furniture in her house? Probably. <laughs> Ralik stepped back with a slight bow, then left. Baruch said, greetings, Derudan. Permit me to introduce Lord Anamander Rake, Lord the Witch Derudan. Rake said, forgive the mask. It is best that it remain on, however. Smoke streamed down from Der Derudan's nose. She said, my compatriots share my growing unease, yes? We feel the approaching storm, and while Baruch continues to reassure us, still the misgivings, yes? Rake said, should it prove necessary, I will attend to the matter personally. I do not believe, however, that our greatest threat is the one beyond the city's walls. A suspicion, which no more. Baruch asked to hear of Rake's suspicions. Rake hesitated, then shook his head. He said, unwise. The matter is presently too sensitive to be broached. I shall remain here for now, however. Derudan waved dismissively at Baruch's angry growl and said, True, the Torud Cabal is unused to feeling helpless, yes? True also, dangers abound, and any might prove a faint a diversion, yes? <laughs> Cunning is the Empress. For myself, I affirm the trust between us, Lord. The way she talks is interesting. Yeah, very Yoda meets Kruppa. <laughs> Derudan smiled at Baruch and said, We must speak, you and I, alchemist, she said, linking arms with him. Rake bowed to the woman and said, A pleasure meeting you, witch. He watched the witch and the alchemist walk away, the servant scurrying at Derudan's heel. I wonder how much the margin for error is with that hookah. How long you think that hose is? Right? <laughs> I'm assuming she's probably got about a good five, four, five foot hose. She's, uh, is the hose indicative of wealth? I don't know. So, not sure. Okay. <laughs> not, not either. So I'm, I'm assuming she can afford at least a four or five foot hose. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Much longer than that, then gravity starts being hard to use it, wouldn't you imagine? I've never smoked a hookah, so I don't know. I never have either, but I think the only thing coming through it is the smoke. So yeah, probably not that it bad. Should, it shouldn't be hard, no. Kruppa intercepted a servant burdened with delicious-looking savories. Taking two handfuls at random, he turned back to resume his conversation with Crocus. He stopped. The lad was nowhere in sight. What's really important here? The savories, of course. This is a well, once-in-a-year opportunity for him. I agree. <laughs> the pastries, man. Mm -hmm. But shoving food in his own face is a pretty full-time gig for that dude. It is. But these are special treats. Yes. These are the, yeah, the uh, once-a-year... <laughs> The crowd milled about on the terrace, some upset, although the majority appeared simply confused. Where was Lady Simtal? they asked. Some grinning changed the question to, who's she with? Already a new wave of anticipation rose among the nobles. They circled like vultures, waiting for their faltering hostess. Smiling beatifically behind the cherub mask, Kruppa raised his eyes slowly to the balcony overlooking the patio, in time to see a figure appear as a dark, feminine silhouette behind the shutters. He licked sticky sugar from his fingers, smacking his lips. He said, There are times, Kruppa murmurs, when celibacy born of sad deprivation becomes a boon, nay, a source of great relief. Dear Marilio, prepare for a storm. <laughs> Simtel pushed apart two slats of the shutters and looked down. She said, you were right. They have indeed retired to the terrace. Odd with that storm coming. I should get dressed. She returned to the bed and began to collect her clothing, which lay scattered all around it. She asked, and what about you, Marilio? Don't you think your companion below is wondering where you are, dear lover? Marilio swung his legs over the bedside and pulled on his tights. He said, I think not. 
Semtal shot him a curious look and asked, who did you come with? He said, just a friend. I doubt you'd recognize the name. Suddenly, the door's lock snapped and the door itself slammed inward. Dressed only in her underclothes, Simtel let loose a startled cry. Her eyes flashed at the tall, cloaked man standing in the doorway. She said, How dare you enter my bedroom? Leave at once or I'll call. Ralik said, Both guards patrolling this hallway have departed, lady. He stepped into the room and closed the door behind him, then glanced at Murillo. He snapped, Get dressed. Simtel asked, Departed, and moved to place the bed between herself and Ralik. Ralik said, their loyalty has been purchased. The lesson shouldn't be lost on you. Simtal said, I need only scream and others will come. Ralik grinned and said, but you haven't because you're curious. Simtal straightened and said, you don't dare harm me. Turban or will hunt you down. Ralik took another step forward and said, I'm here only to talk, Lady Simtal. You won't be harmed no matter what you deserve. She said, deserve? I've done nothing. I don't even know you. Ralik quietly said, Neither did Councilman Lim, and tonight the same could be said for Turban Orr. Both men paid for their ignorance, alas. Fortunate that you missed the duel, lady. It was unpleasant, but necessary. His eyes hardened on her. He said, allow me to explain. Turban Orr's offer of contract to the Assassin's Guild is now officially canceled. Call lives, and now his return to this house is assured. You're done with, Lady Simtel. Turban Orr is dead. He turned and walked from the room, closing the door behind him. Marilio rose slowly. He looked into Simtal's eyes, seeing there a growing terror. Her once secure defenses collapsed. He watched as she seemed physically to contract, her shoulders drawing inward, her hands clasped at her stomach, knees bending. Then he could look no longer. The Lady Simtal was gone, and he dared not study too closely the creature in her place. It's an amazing transformation that takes place when someone like this has the only thing they care about stripped from them. Yeah, it's it was their whole purpose for a living, apparently, and now there's nothing. Yeah. And also, there's a lot of reveal. I mean, she's just revealed that Cole is alive and that Turbinor is dead also. So that's a lot to take in for this woman, too. Mm -hmm. Her only measure of support has been removed. Yes. And if all you rely on is power and you don't cultivate friendships based on trust and loyalty, this is what you end up with, right? Exactly. That's exactly what you end up with. Nothing. It's a sad existence. Yes, it is. Marilio unsheathed his ornamental dagger and tossed it onto the bed. Without another word or gesture, he left the room, knowing with certainty that he would have been the last man to see her alive. Out in the hallway, he paused. In a soft voice, he said, Maori, I'm not cut out for this. Planning to reach this point was one thing. Having now reached it was another. He hadn't considered how he'd feel. Justice got in the way of that, a white fire he'd had no reason to look behind or push aside. Justice had seduced him, and he wondered what he had just lost. He wondered at the death he felt spreading within him. The regret following in that death's wake, so unanswerable it was, threatened to overwhelm him. Maori, he whispered a second time, as close to praying as he'd ever been. I think I'm now lost. Am I lost? We've talked about it before. He who seeks revenge digs two graves, right? Yeah. And he's just now realizing that. Yeah. What do you think about Marilio giving her that dagger? You know, at, at first, I think it was a little cold-blooded, but at the same time, it's just, you know, this is all this woman's got, and I'm not sure what else, if she might face charges for this going down at her, but I, I don't know if she would have killed herself if he hadn't given it to her, or if he's just suggesting it, or if she's going to take this route anyhow. But it's a little dark, a little cold. But that's why he feels like he does, I'm guessing. He has a little guilt. Because seeing what happened to her when she found that information out, even for all the bad stuff she's done, you do kind of feel bad for her. Yeah. I agree with you that I felt it was kind of cold-blooded because in that moment of weakness, she might not have killed herself. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. And in that moment of weakness where you're in that much distress, you can't really see any positive outcomes at all and you see that knife there it's just like mm. nudging you towards it yeah you know that's kind of what I, that's kind of what i'm getting at but at the same so it'll i understand why Morelio feels like he does is because he's like pretty sick with himself on being mm. involved in the whole in the whole affair but at the same time they love their I, i've part of what i love about them is how much they love cole and she must be in a, you know we're not even really sure exactly what all she did what she did is yes. bad yeah i you mean it, it was bad 
Yeah. It's bad. And mm-hmm. so it's, she, did she have it coming? Yeah, we all got it coming, but you know, I, on this one, I'm like you, it's, I feel a little both. I feel a little sad for her. Yeah. Even though she deserves it. But <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. but I don't know. I just wishing vengeance on people. I don't know. It just yeah. doesn't sit well. It's not with me. me. It, it's not me. Also, I thought I'd mention that Maori is a goddess also known as the Lady of Beggars, Slaves, and Serfs, and the Lady of the Poor. It's an interesting invocation from Aurelio, who travels in the wealthy circles. Does he travel in the wealthy circles, or does he pray on the wealthy circles? Both. Okay. Because I mean, he, I mean, it would require, but I, I'm, we're never really sure. What is he? Is he just a dandy? Is he just that's a guy who survives on his good. That's what I'm, like, just survives on his good looks. So I'm guessing he's kind of a rascal himself, and yeah, just sponges off the good looking ladies with the money. <laughs> they have a word for men like that nowadays. <laughs> yes. What is it nowadays? <laughs> F boy. Oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> Basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah sounds about right <laughs> yeah crocus edged around a marble pillar his eyes on the rather short bargas war maiden sitting on the fountain's rim he waited for his opportunity and when it came he darted from the shadows between the first line of trees slipping into the darkness crocus turned and crouched yes she still sat there facing in his direction he drew a deep breath then stood then stood straight a pebble in one hand eyeing the guards he waited Half a minute later, he found his chance. He stepped forward and flung the pebble into the fountain. Chalice Darl jumped, then looked round as she wiped droplets of water from her painted face. His heart sank as her gaze passed over him. Then her head whipped back. Crocus gestured desperately. This was it. This was when he'd find out where she stood as far as he was concerned. (laughs) He held his breath and gestured again. With a backward glance toward the patio, Chalice rose and ran to him. As she came close, she squinted at him. Gorless? Is that you? I've been waiting all night. <laughs> Gorless? Who the heck is that? Oh, no. Oh, poor Crocus. Yes. I guess I guess this is where you do find out what's what. So. Oh, yeah. You ain't, you, you ain't Gorless. <laughs> yeah, he should have done a little research. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's been up in Kroll's Tower for the past 12 hours. No, he, before he decided to change his life track, oh, he should have oh, done oh, yeah. a little research. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. But he, he thought, oh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be the one that wins her over. I guess that's yeah. what he thought. I'm going to rise to prominence and become wealthy and get a name for myself. And then I'll get her. <laughs> right, right. Crocus froze. Then without thinking, he lunged forward and put a hand over her mouth, his other arm grabbing her waist. She squealed, trying to bite his palm, and struggled against him, but he dragged her into the darkness of the garden. Now what, he wondered. Yes, now what? That's a hot mess he's got going for himself right there. Yep, yep. Well, you know, everyone needs hostages at some point. At least uh, Samuel L. Jackson thought so. Sorry. Steve Martin, my Steve Martin reference is a comedy bit, but I forgot that Samuel L. Jackson also did this when he was younger. Do you know that about that? No. He was part of Black Panther movement in the 60s. Oh, wow. At a college, it's college in California, either Berkeley or something like that. It's like they took somebody hostage. <laughs> they took some wow. the Black Panther, took some folks hostages. Yeah, you know, I was like, okay. How'd they not go to jail for that? They, I, don't, I don't know anything else other than that. I'm not, I'm assuming that he might have. Oh, wow. I'd have to look into that. I, I, I need to look wild. deeper into that to, to see more, but yes, apparently, yes. And then part yeah. of the gag from Steve Martin is, I always love this giant. I've, I've always got me something I always wanted. I got me some hostages. <laughs> <laughs> They're very nice folks. Uh, you know, got them tied up, and I, I'm going to blow them up at midnight unless I get my demands back. So. <laughs> Circle Bricker leaned against the marble pillar just inside the estate's main chamber. Behind him, guests milled around Turban Orr's body, arguing loudly and voicing empty threats. He wiped at his eyes, trying to calm his heart. He thought, it's over. Queen of dreams, I'm done. I can rest now. Finally rest. He straightened slowly, took a deep breath, adjusted his sword belt, and glanced around. Captain Stillis was nowhere in sight, and the chamber was almost empty except for a knot of servants outside the kitchen entrance. Lady Simtal was still missing, and confusion now seeped into the void of her absence. Circle Breaker looked one last time at the guests in the garden, then he made his way to the doors. As he passed a long table on which sat the remnants of pastries and puddings, he heard faint snoring. Another step forward brought him to the table's end and into view the small round man seated in a plush antique chair. 
The smeared cherub mask hid the man's face, but Circle Breaker could see the closed eyes, and the nasal drone that matched the rise and fall of his chest was loud and steady. He hesitated, then, shaking his head, he moved on. Beyond the gates now within sight waited the streets of Darujistan and freedom. Now that he'd begun his first steps on that path, he would let nothing deter him. He thought, I've done my part. Just another nameless stranger who couldn't run from the face of tyranny. Dear Hood, take the man's shriveled soul. His dreams are over, ended by an assassin's whim. As for my own soul, well, you shall have to wait a while longer. He passed through the gates, welcoming at last the smile that came unbidden to his mouth. And thus, the chapter ends. Mm, good chapter. Definitely Great good chapter. chapter. Yes. Great. A lot of activity, a lot of key moments. Yes. For standout moments, Whiskey Jack almost falling into the fountain when he recognized Rake at the oh, fate yes. was funny. <laughs> yes. And I love it. It was just so great. But I love how the bridge burners just roll with it. And this is, just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Kruppa's treatment of Circle Breaker after his years of service was really impressive. That was especially cool. And it makes me like Krupp all that much more because he's not just a selfish dude looking out for himself. He truly is a good guy while managing to be an incredibly annoying guy. <laughs> right. The duel itself, how quickly it ended, and the method with which Ralic dispatched Turban Orb, oh. along with all the the insults that were passed yes. back and forth. Oh, all of that. Yeah, I've got it, well, first part. part uh, I love that part where Or just right when he pieces it together that that circle breaker, mm-hmm. and then as he's going in for that to be pulled off track by Ralic and all that stuff. It's one of my favorite parts of the book, and it's because we've been working so hard to get here. So it's the underpants plus the plan equals the profit. Mission accomplished. <laughs> but back to the point. I do That's lo- another I love South Park that. reference for, yeah, for those who, <laughs> that are but Back to the point. I, I love all the trash talking with Ralic and that's the turban. And Orr thinks he's being insulted when, you know, he thinks he's being insulting. And then he has it all thrown in his face by Ralic. It's so, the insults don't work on Ralic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, Rake's vicious insult. It's just on, it's just amazing. But, I also like that reveal that the Torrid Cabal is actually pretty happy with if this works out with or being killed, which he was, it works great for them. Yes. And it, could, it makes me wonder, have they been doing some helping behind the scenes? Hard to say. I, I don't know. I mean, we know we know that Kruppa is. I mean, Kruppa's, is Kruppa part of the Torrid Cabal? I think he's listed as such, isn't he? I don't remember. We'll have to look into that. Like, okay. Yeah, because I can't remember either. Yeah. Another standout moment for me, Kruppa randomly grabbing savory tidbits and losing crocus. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, too good. Yeah. Simtol's final moments, you know, it was a dark moment, but pretty standout. It's, it, it is. It's a very standout scene and it's very necessary. But I, but I, I like we talked about earlier, I, I almost feel bad for her there, but mm-hmm. it, it, that's okay. That's okay. But it's okay that we feel bad for her. She had it coming, but it's okay to feel bad for her too. Yeah. I mean, you can feel bad for human beings. Yes. When they have bad stuff happening to them. Yeah. Exactly, even if you don't like them. <laughs> yeah. Then Marilio's handling of that situation with Simtel, you know, that was also yeah. interesting to see how he responded to finishing up the plan. The plan. Yeah. The plan. Really good. Crocus getting crushed again. <laughs> oh, my God, this kid. Yeah. Finally, Circle Breaker choosing not to expose the eel. Yes. That was really interesting. Yeah, I love it. And it's like, I love all that facts. Do you think that Kruppa would have been, actually, was he really asleep? He would probably woke up and that guy went, grabbed for his mask, but. He is, in fact, asleep. Okay. So, but I think that it's one of those things that I like that character of Circle Breaker, even though you don't still get a chance to really know it, know him, but his loyalty and all, everything about him is very, it's very cool. It's very yes. neat. Mm-hmm. All right. You got any final thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I think we've passed a real critical juncture in this story, uh, but now onto the real action. So, but no, seriously, that was a great chapter. I just truly love this part of the story wrapping up. And I love how much Marilio and Ralic have worked to help their friend Cole. And I love how much the tour cabal, and I love how much they would have stood behind their actions and how much they do stand behind their actions. I just really dig that. Yeah. The good guys win for once. And then of course you get, tur- yes, they do. And Turban or is dead. And I, and he's, I was, I hate to say that, but he's such a jerk. I was wait. I just always eagerly await his death <laughs> when we get to this part, don't you? Yeah, he's just insufferable. He is insufferable. He was insufferable. Now we can say he was. He was. <laughs> yes. All right. Great job tonight. Great episode. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Yep. See you next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today.
If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Thank mm-hmm. you.